evening, everyone, and welcome to Discovering Revelation Seminar. Glad you're here tonight. We're going to have a great time together as we open God's Word and see what's going to be happening in the future for America and the world according to the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. So you're going to really enjoy this. Our only textbook is the Bible, and uh, we are going to dig into the Bible. I'm Harry Sharley. I'm the host for this seminar. And so uh, some, of, some of you are wondering, if I forget something that's presented, uh, how can I remember? We're going to give you a full-color study notes at the end of each presentation as you leave. So tonight you'll receive study notes, the highlights of the presentation tonight as you leave. So uh, I want to congratulate you for coming. Uh, you are part of the largest Prophecy Seminar Presentation and Series in Yakima in the year 2020. And in addition to that, uh, you are part of one of America's largest prophecy series this year as we are a host site along with about over 100 other sites across America. So glad you're here, and I know that you'll be glad that you came. Here's a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, drinking fountains and restrooms are down the hall that way. Each night we also provide free child care. If you know of someone that wanted to come but didn't know what to do with the kitties, we've got a good team down there at the end of the hall uh, past the drinking fountain. And also to uh, minimize risk of infections, we're just suggesting that we don't shake hands or give bear hugs during the seminar. You can, uh, you, can, uh, you can do elbow bumps, uh, uh, that's fine, and uh, we just, and good hand washing and all that. And if s someone happens to get some cold symptoms, uh, they are asked, suggesting to us that we rest at home until we are free of the symptoms. Here's a few other things you'll want to know. Tomorrow, we are going to have out of registration a, uh, a question box. So there may be some questions that you have in your mind that you're, you'd like to ask about the Bible, uh, about Bible prophecy. You are welcome to write down any Bible question, put it in the question box, and we will try to answer that question at some point in our seminar. Uh, tonight we're going to have a drawing, and uh, so we'd like to invite uh, the uh, uh, registration uh, folks to bring that uh, drawing a box and basket up right now and we're going to uh, draw some three three names out of that basket and uh, give some books away the books are more than a carpenter by Josh McDowell a uh, an amazing present short presentation on who Jesus Christ really is Messiah a great short book about the life of Jesus Christ and Real Heroes, Amazing Stories from the Bible, uh, uh, with beautifully illustrated and a book for uh, children and young people. So, uh, Jorge, uh, let's see what we can do here. Now, we don't want to just pick the one off the top, do we? Nope. No, but we could if we wanted to, right? Yeah. Okay, well, let's do it then. Let's take the one right off the top, and that's Sterling Sigsworth. Okay, Sterling, let's give Sterling a hand. <laughs> okay, uh, here we go. We just need a runner. There we go. Okay, and here's another one. This is Hayden Tizignoff. Hayden, raise your hand. Okay, good. And uh, Hayden, I'll give you a choice. Here's one, great story about Jesus, no pictures, the little one. This other one, lots of pictures. Okay, you got it. Whoops, sorry about that. Okay, good. Okay, let's give him a hand. Hayden. Paige Og, raise your hand. Paige. Okay, good. Here it is. Okay, Paige. We just wanted to embarrass you. Here you go. Enjoy. All right. Thank you, Jorge. There are more of these flyers. Many of you 
saw, have seen this flyer before. How many of you saw this flyer in your mailbox? Let me see your hands. Most of you. Great. Thank, yeah, there it is right there. Good. We wanted to make sure you got invited. And uh, we've got more of these on the registration table. As you leave tonight, take a few of them and invite others to come with you and be your guest tomorrow as we are continuing on with this prophecy seminar. We are very happy tonight to have Austin Greer as our presenter. Austin Greer is, has a background in biblical studies. He has spoken across the western states. He has a way of relating to young and old alike and as a great teaching method of, of just opening the scriptures, letting the scriptures speak, and making prophecy plain for us in, as we see our things changing in our country and in our world very rapidly right before our eyes. Uh, that's uh, all we need to say as we get started. So let's welcome our speaker, Austin Greer. Good evening, everybody. It's so exciting to be here with you tonight, to see your smiling faces and your eager hearts to get into God's Word. Who's excited to discover Revelation tonight? I know I am. And this is a very special seminar that we're having tonight. It's been to six of seven continents. You see, I'm a representative for Voice of Prophecy. and It's been a, one of the first religious broadcasts since the 1930s. Would you believe that? Since the 1930s. And it's connected to one of the largest Bible mailing correspondence schools, longest lasting, longest running. And so it's been supplying many people with insights into God's Word. So I'm excited to open up God's Word with you tonight. And I just want to give you a taste of what is to come. This is how we're doing the seminar. We are going to be studying one book and one book alone, the Bible. You see, there is so much clarity in this book when you read the whole thing. Details in there that describe clearly what the author is trying to say. And so we're going to be using this book. Now that's not to say there are, aren't other books that are valuable. But I've noticed over time, there's so many books with many opinions and theories that there's some confusion about books like Daniel and Revelation. And so we're going to be dealing with actually what the Bible says. And I think you'll be amazed to see how clear it becomes when you read the whole thing. It's going to be awesome. Now, we're going to be taking a bite-sized approach. There is a lot in God's Word. It's deep, it's dense, and it's filling. So every night, we're going to be touching on the big themes of Revelation. And each night, we're going to build on the previous night, kind of like building a house. You start with the foundation, then you put up the studs, and then the walls, the doors, the windows, and before you know it, you can step back and see the whole thing plain as day. So we're going to be building a house of truth based on God's word. Now, because we're covering so much content, and I know you note takers will try your best to take notes, and sometimes it just, you can't get it all down. I'll be supplying you with notes at study guides at the end of our presentation. So you can take that home and review. And I'd love to take questions during this time. But because we're going to be moving at a fairly rapid sp uh, pace, we are going to put a question box in the back for you to get your questions answered. I want to hear them. I want to do my best to answer them for you. I'm interested to hear your questions. So tomorrow night, there will be a question box in the lobby. And there's just a few rules I want to lay out for that question box. The first rule is it needs to be a Bible question. Why, you why do you drive an ugly car is not a Bible question. <laughs> second, second rule is um, if there are a lot of questions, I'm just going to give priority to the ones that deal with topics we've already covered. So if your question doesn't get, um, isn't get spoken, it's nothing personal. Um, we're just keeping a fairly narrow focus during this seminar. Now, the third rule is no preachy questions. We have people from all different backgrounds here, and I want this to be comfortable for everybody. Now, an example of a preachy question is something like this. Why do some people do this when the Bible says they should do that? It's not really a Bible question. It's just an attempt to preach to somebody else in the room, and I'm not going to do that. Sound fair? Very good. 
And um, I hope that you find this interesting and that you're comfortable enough to throw those questions in there. Now tonight, um, our topic is a new world order. There's much talk about this uni new unity that brings the whole world together. And you've got to wonder, is it true? Well, we're going to be looking at a prophecy that goes back 2,000 years, and you can be the judge. Our, our topic tomorrow night is planet in upheaval. Everywhere you go, you'll hear people saying, the world is not like it used to be. It's changing. Climate is changing. There's more violence. Political tensions are increasing. And there's far more natural disasters. And you've got to wonder, is it really true? Is the world on the verge of big changes? And is, is Christ coming soon? We're going to be digging into God's word and evaluating it and let you be the judge. And then on Sunday night, we have Armageddon. You've probably heard that word in Hollywood. They love to use it. But what is it? We're going to be looking at what the Bible says what it is. Is it a nuclear war? Is it an asteroid coming to hit the world? We're going to get into God's word. It's going to be a very special evening because I'm going to be laying out for you principles, basic principles and tools that will help you study Revelation for yourself. It'll be a wonderful night. You don't want, won't want to miss it. And then on Tuesday, we have a, the, the core theme of Revelation in our topic, the man of Revelation. You won't want to miss this when you absolutely need to understand this theme, without which you will not be able to understand the rest of the book. So we're laying a foundation for the rest of our, our study in this seminar. Then on Wednesday night, we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. For generations, people have been discussing, who are they? What are they? Are, when are they coming? Well, I think you will be pleasantly surprised to see the puzzle pieces come together that night. And what, something that surprises a lot of people is a lot of this prophecy has already been fulfilled and is taking place today. So in that presentation, we're going to be mapping out a structure of Bible prophecy, something that frames it for you, so you know where to put all this information we're studying. Sound good? Very good. I'd like to pray before we get into God's Word, so if you bow your heads with me. Dear Father in Heaven, I want to thank you that we have a sure word to, to found our lives on. We have come here, Father, to learn truth. Some are curious. Some have been in the faith for many years. But wherever we are at tonight, we ask, Lord, that you would meet us where we're at. Give us sharp minds. Give us close attention that we won't miss a word of what you're wanting us to learn tonight. We thank you for your love. We pray for your spirit to be with us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the most basic questions we must address before we get started is this question. Is there meaning or direction to our existence? Or are we accidents? Is this world an accident? Accidental life forms on an accidental planet with, with no direction? Does God even really exist? Fundamental questions that many have had on, have on their mind. And we're going to dig into that question in a very strange place. What you see here up on the screen is Duke Wellington and Napoleon Bonaparte. These men were mortal enemies. They met at the Battle of Waterloo in 1812, and, or 1813, excuse me. And uh, there's a lot people know about these two, but we're going to learn something that many do not know. They had many similarities. Check this out. They were both born in 1769, born to, on an island, both lost their fathers in early childhood. Both had three sisters and four brothers. Both were attending military school in France at the same time, and both became lieutenant colonels within a day of each other. Now, it doesn't stop there. Both were excellent at math. Both were great commanders of large armies. And when they met at Waterloo, one won, one was defeated. And they wonder, how did this come? Because there's this word called stalemate in, when it comes to war, where two armies are battling together, and they go back and forth and back and forth for weeks and weeks and weeks and months even. But here we have an equally matched competition, and yet one lost quickly. 
relatively quickly. And there are some theories as to why. Some say the geography favored the Duke of Wellington. It made it easy for him to overcome Napoleon. Some say it was the support of the Prussian army that gave him extra strength. Some say Napoleon was just tired. It wasn't what he used to be. He'd gone through a lot. You see, his excursion into Russia was a disaster. The Russian winter wiped out so many of his men. And when the Sixth Coalition defeated him at Leipzig, they also invaded France. Then he was exiled to Elba, and then he fought and fought. And he was not the man he once was. He was tired. That's what they say. But is that what defeated Napoleon? Is there any direction, is there any meaning in the happenings of history at all? Before we get into that, I want to point out that like Napoleon and Duke Wellington, we also have some similarities. We also have a similarity. We all thrive in healthy relationships. I want to dig just for a moment into a theme that is essential for understanding prophecy. We all thrive on relationships. We were made to be our best selves, made to grow in a loving, committed, loving, committed relationships. And without that, things break down. And I think it must be understood what the Bible says about God in John 4, 16. God is love. We were emotionally, psychologically, physically, even biologically engineered for love, for healthy relationships. And here it says, God is love. And now there's something that love requires. If you were going to say one thing that love, a relationship needs to thrive, what would you say it is? Let's get some hands raised. Go ahead. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other ideas? What would make a relationship nice and strong? Come again. Ah, we don't even need to go any further. Can everyone agree with that? Communication is so necessary. It saves us so many problems if we just listened, right? Communication. Love requires communication. And here we say, we see um, God desires to communicate to us. Now, it's in Genesis. It tells us God made us like him. God created man in his own image. He made us to love like him. You see, God, he doesn't want just, as he, as he told his disciples in, in John, he says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what the master is doing. You see, the slave-master relationship is a very low level of relationship, is what Jesus says. It's, I'm in charge, and you're going to listen to me because of that. It's, 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 the slave-master relationship isn't about understanding. It's, I'm in charge, you listen to me. And Jesus is saying, that's a very low level relationship. What I want with you is to be friends. I don't, in fact, God is saying... I don't want control over you. I want a reciprocal friendship that goes both ways. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from the Father. I have made known to you. So God is a God of love. He made us to love. Love requires communication. So if this is what's going on, then God, is a, God will communicate to us. Yes or no? Yes. So if, if you believe God is a God of love, then you would assume you could, you could reasonably lo, um, 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 end that with logic that he would go out of his way to do what for us? Communicate. Yes. God desires to communicate. And check this out, what he says about prophecy. In John 14. And now I have told you before it comes to pass that you, when it does come to pass, you may do what? Believe. God knows it's hard for us to believe. It's hard for us to have faith. So he's given us evidence in prophecy. 
He's given us evidence that we can put our faith in so that we may know there's a God in the universe that cares for us and has our best interest at heart. He supplied us with evidence. And so we come back to our original question. Is there meaning and direction? Are those theories the reasons why Napoleon lost? Or is there some purpose driving history? We begin in a strange place, the bedchamber of a king, King Nebuchadnezzar of Neo-Babylon, a ruling power of the world, a wealthy place. One night, something troubles him. It's a dream. In fact, it's a nightmare. It leaves him waking up, heaving and breathing and sweating in fear. This man who was afraid of nothing has had this nightmare that has left him in distress. He's anxious. Let's read what it says in the book of Daniel here. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and it spir- his spirit was so troubled that, he, that his sleep left him. That his sleep left him. He couldn't go back to sleep. Does anyone, has anyone else struggle with that? You just have a dream, and it just kind of lingers with you. Something was different about this. In fact, this dream was telling him he was going to lose his kingdom. And that's the last news a king wants to hear. So he calls all his wise men, which are also known as the Chaldeans, the Magi. They're the astronomers, the mathematicians, the prophets, the priests, the scientists, the university professors, the philosophers. The men he relied on for keen advice. He calls them all in. And he tells them, I need you to help me out here. This is what he says. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. I want to pause there. I just want to take note here that God is the God who goes to the anxious heart. He does not leave us in our troubles. He comes into our situation to bring clarity and truth that allows us to continue to function, to continue to move forward. He cares for your anxious heart tonight. I want you to know that. We continue on. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. They say, okay, king, we've done this before. You tell us a dream. We'll pull out our interpretation books, and we're going to tell you what it means. A king answered and said, for the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known to the, the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your house shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the, the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. It's a pretty ruthless guy. But you could understand, he had laid his life in the hands of these advisors. He was looking to them for truth. And now he he smells a rat. Something's rotten in Denmark. And he says, I'm not going to let you guys trick me anymore. You guys need to prove your salt or not. And he couldn't trust him. They answered again and said, let the king tell the the servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me, of the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. That's a bad day at work, wouldn't you say? Talk about work being challenging. They were asked to do something no one had ever done before, and they, they, they are speechless. And we, we see in 1 Kings 8.39, For you alone know the hearts of all sons of men. That's God. Only God knows our heart. Only God knows what's going on in here. And he cares. He cares what's going on in our lives. And here we read in Daniel, back in Daniel, it is a difficult thing that the king requests. And there is 
no other who can tell it to the king, except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For the reason the king was angry and very furious and given the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. This is when a Jewish, young Jewish prince, exiled from Jerusalem, comes into the picture. You see, this is a, a young man named Daniel. When Babylon had taken over Israel, they took some of the brightest, most gifted young men, and he was one of them. And they brought him into the University of Babylon and were training him, re, trying to reshape his thinking, hoping that he would influence his people and the other young men he brought with them. And so they come to Daniel. Daniel, you're fired. No severance pay. Nothing. What is this? The guard, Ariok, comes to tell Daniel that all the king's men are going to be killed. So what he does, is he asks for time. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time, that he might tell the king the interpretation. He asked for time to do what? To say, send letters to his family? To go live it up in the city? His last final moment? No. Daniel asked for time that he may pray. Because while he did not know the interpretation, who knew the interpretation? God. And he went with his friends into prayer. And in the morning, he entered the throne room. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He does what? He reveals secrets. Things people don't know, God knows, and he wants us to know them as well. Continuing on. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. In the where? The latter days, your dream and the visions of your heart upon your bed were these. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you. And its form was awesome. The, this, these images, the image's head was of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, and its Excuse me. Its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. God gave the answer to the king. He gave it to him through Daniel. So what was the dream about? A massive statue. And the statue had all different metals and that wasn't the end. There's one other interesting fact we need to hear. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The world carried them away. The wind carried them away so that no traces of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and, and filled. It filled the whole earth. There was silence. You could hear a pen drop. And the king rose trembling. Daniel, that's it. You've answered my question. You've revealed a secret no one could. Daniel, your God is amazing. But what does it mean? Daniel's about to reveal it, and he's also about to reveal to us a very important principle, a basic principle to understanding Bible prophecy, and that is we need to read the whole thing that it may interpret itself. If we're going to study the Bible, we're going to find things we've never heard before, we've never read before, so we must let it teach us what it means. Now, there's all sorts of ideas as to what these different metals refer to. Some might say, oh, chest and arms of silver. Silver, that's like a, um, Fort Knox, you know, there's like, or, or Colorado. 
oh, you know, the gold, the head of gold, it's Fort Knox. We've got riches there. We've made connections. But is that what the author intended us to understand? We must let it interpret itself. And that's what we're going to do right now. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven. So who was the head of gold? Good. Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom of Babylon, was this head of gold. Now, where did we get that from? What? We got it from the book of Daniel. He has told us what it means. It's a, continuing. He has given them into your hands and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. God is telling Nebuchadnezzar here, you built an amazing kingdom, but you know what? I put you there. I put you there. Not by your own power, not by your own wisdom. I have helped you build this kingdom because I've been with you through it all. That's, this is Babylon. Babylon was a wealthy nation. It was probably one of the wealthiest in history, and it truly was a nation of gold. We have actually still think like Babylonians today. We got a lot from them. We got base 60 mathematics. So we have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, we have in a circle 360 degrees, and you've heard of horoscopes and astrology, it all came from Babylon. They changed history, this amazing nation. But is Babylon ruling the world today? Tell me. No, Babylon came down. Nebuchadnezzar didn't like the sound of that, but this is what God told him. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Inferior. Usually it's a stronger nation, but this is an inferior nation that will rise up. Now, who was it? Who defeated Babylon? It was Persia, or Medo-Persia. It was a combination. It was when Cyrus came into Babylon to siege it, and they found these really high walls, triple lined. They couldn't break through. They couldn't climb over, but there was one chink in the armor. The river Euphrates flowed through Babylon, and all Cyrus did was drain it into an ancient man-made lake, and they had a highway whew, right into the city, and they took it over. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Is Persia still in control of the world today? No. There's a third kingdom represented here. Now, who's this kingdom of bronze? Who defeated the Persians? It was the Greeks. The Greeks under the leadership of Alexander the Great. Now, this is amazing. This amazes me. He, co he, oh, he uh, conquered 2 million square miles of, of land, 20 million subjects in four years flat. You know what I did in four years? All I got was a bachelor's and a minor. He was only 32 when he did it. Amazing. And the story goes, he pushed and pushed all the way till the Indian coast. He's looking out in the ocean at the end of, this, of the land and started to cry because there was no one else to conquer. So he turned back with his men tired and nothing else to do. The story goes that he died in his sleep. Some say he'd, he had drunk himself to death. Though he conquered the world, they say he couldn't conquer himself. Are the Greeks ruling today? Are the Greeks ruling today? No, they're not. Why? And the fourth kingdom, there's a fourth. Nebuchadnezzar, there's, there's, there's a fourth kingdom here. It shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes the kingdom who breaks in pieces and crushes all the others. Rome was strong. Rome was violent. It had a powerful army. And they changed the face of the world. We actually use their political system and structure in it today. They influenced much. The legs of iron was Rome. It was Rome. And they did a great job. You know, there's that phrase, all roads lead to Rome. They made sure 
Everyone pointed to this one power that we were all united in this together, this empire. But is Rome ruling today? No, it's not. But check this out. The image of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the Iron Monarchy of Rome. Now, this is a famous author with one of the most, um, the best, clearest perspectives on history. It's a very well-to-do book. Doesn't it sound like he was reading Daniel when he he wrote that? We continue on. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be what? divided. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Now notice it's focusing on the toes here. Toes you'd think are insignificant. They're small, but you know, you can't really walk without them. But it's focusing on the toes here. Why? Why? It says this once united western empire split. And you know, if you look in history, that's absolutely what happened. The East became stronger than the West, and before you knew it, the barbarian tribes took their peace and divided the the empire. And you see here, the divided Western empire, the Anglo-Saxons became the Brits, it became British, and the Franks became who? The French. The Suvi became the Portuguese and so on, there are, the, uh, for example, the Alemanni became the German, the Lombards became the Italians, but then you have the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Heruli, which don't exist today. They don't exist today. But these ten barbarian tribes, the ten toes, they divided the empire just like the dream predicted. As you saw iron mixed with clay, ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seeds of men, and they will not, what? Adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. There were many attempts to unite the empire once again. Many attempts. Many brilliant people gave it a shot, but it remained divided. And we're going to take a trip through history and look at some of the great people who were close, were very close. Queen Victoria is one of them. She was known as the grandmother of Europe. Why? Because all her children, she'd marry them to royal families so she could make these alliances to to build the empire. And it it said that she was actually related to all the heads of state uh, before you knew it. But you know what? She didn't do it. When she died... The following century, the 20th century, was the bloodiest century yet. She tried. Why couldn't she do it, though? Because God said they would not adhere. But then you have Charlemagne. He, after 300 years of not having a Roman emperor, he comes in. King of the Franks. He takes over Italy as well a few years later. This is in 778 uh, AD. And he was a brilliant soldier. And he almost did it. He was bringing the people together. But then it came time to pass that empire on. The plan was to give it to his two sons, his oldest sons. But they died before him. So there was plan B. Give it to his youngest son and an illegitimate son. But they were both incompetent to rule. And the kingdom fell apart after his death. Charlemagne could not do it, not because he wasn't smart. Not just because his his children weren't smart, but because God said they would not adhere. Then you have Charles V. He was a strong leader. He got very close. He was taking his men into battle. He had conquered about 1.2 million square miles of land. And then he got sick. He got gout. He couldn't ride out to, to war with his men and... Before you knew it, they were losing, and before you knew it, he died. He was close. He was close. But God said, in prophecy, they would not adhere. Then you have Louis XIV. He was quite the arrogant man. 
He said, I am the state. I don't just run it. I am the state. Now, he was doing everything he could to unite, unite all the people, and he was doing a good job. He was, again, winning battles and bringing nations together, but then he made a very poor decision. He united two countries that ended up join, going into a war, the Spanish succession, and that was the beginning of the end for that. And once again, disunity was broken. They did not adhere just as God had said. But then you have Napoleon. We just talked about him. Brilliant leader. Brilliant leader. He, at one point, took the power from the Pope. He took the crown right off his head, put it on himself, and said, I'm the new, the new leader here. And he was working to liberate Europe. He was working to liberate the people. But as we, as we read... Obstacles came in his way, and he neither was able to do it. Not because Napoleon wasn't smart, not because he didn't have a great army, but because God had predicted they would not adhere. We're going to jump forward closer to our time with Kaiser Wilhelm in the World War II, the Soviet, the Soviet, or excuse me, Kaiser Wilhelm thought he could do it. been a long day. <laughs> Kaiser Wilhelm was getting close. He was a brilliant leader. He was winning wars, and he was doing a good job. But then the British started asking America for alliance, for some support, and when he got wind of that, he hatched a plan to ask Mexico to keep America busy, and he sent what's called the Zimmerman Telegram. This telegram was sent to Mexico saying, hey, you keep them busy, and we'll help you win some more of that land back that America took from you. But something got in the way. The British got a hold of this telegram and were able to decipher it, and they discovered that there was an alliance just about to happen. And you know, President Wilson at first was says, President Wilson said, we will not get involved. It's not our war. But you know what? Well, he was so mad when he heard, got this telegram that he joined the war, and Kaiser Wilhelm was crushed. He tried. But God had said, they will not adhere. Then we have Adolf Hitler. He was a soldier in Kaiser Wilhelm's army, and he was embarrassed and ashamed at this loss. He couldn't handle it. And he said, we are going to win this war. I'm going to build an empire, a Reich that lasts for a thousand years, and we're going to do it without God. And he says, see, my people, we do not need anything from God. We do not ask him for anything except that he may let us alone. We want to fight our own war with our guns, without God. We want to gain, excuse me, we want to gain nor victory without the help of God. Stories say that someone had actually brought Daniel to to Hitler. And he'd heard these prophecies that it wasn't going to work out. And so he thought, well, if I can't do it with God, we got to do it without him. But when God says something will happen, when he gives his word, it's the sure word. It's something we can lay our future on because it will happen. And he said, they will not adhere. Hitler was not able to do it either. Then you have in World War II, the Soviet Union attempting to do the same thing. With communism, they knew at some point they're going to have to rule the whole world. And they were, they were dominating quite a bit of Europe, Eastern Europe, even parts of Germany. But the time came where they couldn't do it either. And in 1989, the wall came down. And they lost. They couldn't do it either because God said, they will not adhere. They will not. Then you have the European Union, and this is interesting. This isn't even a political alliance. It's an economical alliance, and, yes, and, let, and yet the hopes that were put in it have not been fruitful. There are, uh, there are nations that aren't allowed to be involved. There are nations that don't want to be involved. Just in January, Britain exited the Union in Brexit, and it's just fallen apart. It's not working because God said they will not adhere. And God's word is sure. But there was more 
to that dream than just kingdoms being destroyed and ending. Let's continue to read. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set upon, set upon a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. What God sets in place is unconquerable. And we see all these nations rose and fell as he predicted. And if God was correct about those prophecies, what can we expect about this final part? That he's, he's right on with this too. There is a new world coming, a kingdom that will never, ever be destroyed. And it's going to be a kingdom founded on love. Perfect, other-centered love. For God is not looking to have control over us. He's looking to befriend us. Unite in perfect, other-centered respect. Let's continue on in this verse. And the kingdoms shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. There's this emphasis on forever. This is the kind of place you want to raise your family. This is the kind of place you want to retire. It's perfect. And God meant it for us. Matthew 25 tells us, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with them, with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. There will come a time where Jesus returns to take his faithful people home. And it's not because they were so faithful, but it's that, like Daniel, they relied on his sure word. They just followed his word. They trusted in him. Not man's wisdom, not the magi, the astrologers, the philosophers. Daniel trusted in the God that had been with him his whole life the God that would come and visit the most powerful man in the world, Nebuchadnezzar, and give him a dream to make known to him what was to come. Not to, not to tease his interest, not to help him plan to make his kingdom stronger, but to develop friendship that Nebuchadnezzar would know him. And tonight, you've all come here. I believe no one is here by coincidence. When it comes to good things and spiritual things, God draws us with purpose. Like in the, the, throughout history, God has guided history. He's guided you here tonight to know him better, to know him for yourself. And it's my prayer that you also find more evidence to put your faith on, more evidence to have confidence in the God who cares for you and whose best interest is in his, your best interest in his, is in his heart. There's a story about a little boy who loved reading. And this is in the time before video games and iPads. And his favorite genre of book was the, the westerns. He loved to see the cowboys and the Indians firing. And his favorite series was about Sheriff Brown. And he just devoured these books. Books after books he was devouring because he loved Sheriff Brown. Because he was the man that saved all the people. He was the smart one that could outwit any criminal. He was strong. And he picked up another book, the new book, and he was excited to read it. So he begins reading, excited to see how Sheriff Brown is going to overcome evil this time. But then he reads, there's an outlaw, a new outlaw in town. And he starts to get worried. Because he reads, this outlaw is planning to kill Sheriff Brown. This little boy begins to fear. He's afraid that evil will triumph over good. And he closes the book. He can't read it. He doesn't want, he doesn't know what's going to happen. But then the next day, his mom hears something coming out of the room. Some talking, some chitter-chatter. And you know what? This little boy is kind of like us. He was afraid, afraid of the future. He had fear for the future, so he wouldn't read on. But what he heard, what his mom heard that day was, if he only knew what I knew, if he only knew what I do with this confidence and this brightness in his voice. So his mother walks in and asks, what's, what's going on? Is everything all right? 
And he says, Mom, I couldn't finish the book. I'm just so afraid that Sheriff Brown might lose. He might die. But a great idea came to me today. I thought I would read the last page. And you know what? I found out the story ends well. Good triumphs over evil. Maybe some of you tonight have struggles and evils in your life that you are afraid will cause corrosion and destruction that you fear will last forever. I tell you tonight, the good God of heaven is more powerful than any struggle we'll face, any evil within, any evil without. Good will conquer evil in the end. We, we learned that Persia defeated Babylon, that Greek defeated, Greece defeated Persia, that Rome defeated Greece, that Rome was divided. All of it, history shows, is real. It's not made up stories. So we can trust that the triumph of good is sure. The word of God is sure. And that's what we need in these times. We need something stable. We need something we can trust. And tonight, I, uh, I hope you find that as you journey with us in discovering Revelation. By raise of hands, who can say they were blessed by this prophecy tonight? Me as well. And um, it's, it's our privilege to know more. And I'll tell you, there's a lot more in store. Because God desires to befriend you deeper and deeper without you stressing about it. He'll take care of the details. You just come to know more of him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for being the revealer of truth. In a world that seems to be falling apart, we thank you for stability in your word. I ask God for all here that as they seek you, their questions would be answered. Their fears would be swallowed up in confidence in you. I say you bring us all safely tomorrow night to the next meeting that we may know you better. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, God. Thwart Satan's plans to keep us busy, God. Keep us busy from focusing on spiritual things, Lord. Help us to focus and discover a picture in you that we have never seen before. We love you, Lord, and I thank you so much for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. You won't want to miss tomorrow's topic. It's planet and upheaval. We're going to be developing some solid perspective as we dig into Revelation. So you won't want to miss tomorrow night. And I'll see you then. Have a good night. You will want to read. You can read Matthew 24. If you'd like to get ahead for tomorrow, Matthew 24 will be uh, our main base chapter. So... Study up, and we'll see you tomorrow.